Today, we have a very special guest joining us, Kyle Floyd, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Fox Royalty. Kyle created the concept and built the team required for success in the royalty sector. He's responsible for general operational and strategic direction of the business, and he's helped lead the company to becoming the fastest growing mining royalty business over the past 18 months. Prior to Vox, Kyle held the position of VP Practice Lead of the Global Mining Investment Banking Department at Roth Capital. Thanks for joining us on The Rocks. Let's dive in. Thanks for joining me, Kyle. Welcome to On The Rocks. How are you doing today? I'm fantastic, Emily. How are you doing? I'm good. Although you and I are recording this in the morning. So instead of a bourbon on the rocks, I'm doing shaken espresso from my other Starbucks, which is probably my second love after bourbon. Yeah, me too. Unfortunately, it's a uh, quad shot Americano. Oh, okay. This evening, it'll be probably a Moscow mule ah. with crabbies, which is the which is the key ingredient to make the right kind of mule. Nice. Drink I had once, which was just bourbon on ice with crushed cranberries and rosemary. Yeah. Tasted like the bourbon version of Thanksgiving to me. <laughs> you can't <laughs> go wrong with that. <laughs> Good way. Well, you know, I'm really excited to have you on because you are the first royalty related person we've had on the podcast. So since some folks who listen may not be familiar with that, before we get into Vox and the cool stuff you guys are doing, could you just explain to people what is a royalty company? Sure. A royalty company is essentially a company that aggregates royalty exposure. We go out specifically and we buy interests in the revenue generating capability of mining projects. So in the broader context, That could be a stream or that could be a royalty. There's a slight nuance to streams versus royalties. But what we focus on with Vox is what we call third-party royalties. And so those are interests in the revenue. You might have heard of NSRs, net smelter returns royalties, GVRs, gross value royalties. Those are royalties held by someone or an entity that was involved typically in the finding of that deposit and eventually the sale of that deposit or geological anomaly to another company. And what they retained was a royalty and they may have given received equity and cash as well, but you'll typically see that entity retain a royalty. And so what we do is we go out and we find all these disparate odd entities that might hold royalties. Some are known, some are unknown. And we go out and we acquire those and we bring those into our company in volume and create a portfolio effect around holding these royalties. And some folks might have heard me reference in previous podcasts, governments will get royalties as well. And that's not what you're talking about, right? A lot of countries, there's a royalty fee associated with production that goes to the government. But this is, as you were saying, maybe someone who helped discover or build it retains a part of the production or the profit for lack of a simple word. Exactly. It's the, it's, it's the same thing. Governments just usually don't want to give up their royalties. There's a bunch of complications in that type of situation, but it is same type of document, same type of framework. But we're looking for whether it was the prospector or the original geologist that found it, maybe the junior mining company that had first staked the ground and ended up selling it. Those are the opportunities that we look for. We found royalties that were held by family offices that were essentially salt uh, salt miners, they were cattle ranchers, doctors that previously ran drilling companies, you name it. We found royalties kind of buried all around the world with parties that some you never expect to hold royalties or, or some you you would, but that is our business. But yeah, government royalty is, is very, very similar to, to what we look to acquire. You know, how does that work when you, do you buy the royalty from the person or you buy a part of it? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, sometimes you're buying all of it, sometimes you're buying a part of it. It really depends on the situation and ultimately what the holder of that royalty wants to accomplish. And when you do that, you know, you guys make a distinction that you go to this the third party as opposed to going to a mining company directly and getting a royalty or a streaming agreement. Why do you do that? Why do you do the third party royalty? Yeah, a, a couple of reasons. One, in the royalty space, we found that the best returns have been generated with that type of business model. Two, a lot of the reason around that is because we're not constrained to mining companies seeking capital. And mining companies that will then, as part of their capital structure, capital stack of financing the operation, consider a royalty or stream. So it really broadens the scope of opportunities available to us. And a lot of these situations become bilateral 
us just working with the owner of this royalty versus a process that's shot by an investment bank that allow us to really come to to fair terms for both parties in terms of transacting on the royalty. Oh, interesting. Okay. You're you're typically then working with companies that are at a very different stage and lower risk because they're not doing it to raise money, potentially. Exactly. It, it's tough to pick amongst the mining companies that need capital and that are willing to entertain a stream or a royalty over their project. We found that there's typically a negative selection bias in that. That being said, some companies have been able to make that business model work, but we really built ours around finding these third-party royalties and then being able to look at projects around the world. Most projects, most mining projects have a royalty or a few royalties over their projects. And so the opportunity set is that much greater for us. Okay, very interesting. And would you just clarify, what is the difference between royalty and streaming for those who might think they're the same thing? I'll start with a royalty because that's the simplest. A royalty is typically a percent of the revenue is in which you're entitled to over a distinct mining project. There's typical nomenclature for royalties. NSR is the most common net smelter returns. GVR, which is gross value royalty, free on board royalties. They all essentially equate to the royalty payer gets paid a percent of that revenue. And the value in that is that the royalty company or the royalty owner is then not responsible nor exposed to really any of the cost sides of the business for a mining company. And the royalty owner also doesn't have to contribute any further capital to retain that interest. So it's an undiluted interest. So, And the other thing from a security perspective is typically royalties will run with the land. So it's a very secure interest and it has a lot of benefits and that's not exposed to the cost structure it gets all the upside benefits that you get when you own a mining company. And so that's one of the reasons why royalties have become so popular and why companies like Vox exist is we're able to bring those portfolios in in aggregate in a portfolio and then achieve a portfolio effect, benefits of diversification, et cetera. A stream is typically when a company like Vox would actually go and finance a mining company that needs capital to develop a project or refinance debt, any number of reasons why a mining company would need capital. But that stream basically works as almost like an offtake agreement. Mm. So you give money to the mining company up front in return for receiving a percent of the production, typically over the life of that operation. You're actually financing mining companies. They can be very tax efficient structures and they allow the streaming or royalty company to really hone exposure. So typically you would take a byproduct. So what we've seen a lot of is big copper projects that have precious metals, byproducts, either gold or silver, offering up to one of the majors like Franco or Wheaton, the opportunity to give them capital and then take some of that byproduct precious metal exposure over the duration of that mining project. Interesting. When you talk about Vox, you always you talk a lot about the fact that it's a great way for folks who are new to investing in mining or maybe are are interested in getting exposure to what's going on with commodities and mining in general without having to kind of go in and, and do a lot of the technical due diligence if you were to invest in individual mining stocks. Exactly. And well, you've been at projects all over the world. Mining's a very, very difficult business. And there are some companies and some people that do it extremely well and, and others that don't. And it's really difficult, I believe, for the generalist investor, especially that's not a mining engineer, that's not a geologist, that hasn't been operating the space for a decade and seen all the ways in which mining is so difficult and, and the risks are relevant. This Vox really represents an opportunity for the generalist investor to be able to count on our mining engineers and our geologists to go pick the right projects to be exposed to in a more distilled, better format within royalties to, to generate that exposure. And so we believe we've really distilled the best qualities of royalty companies and the qualities that generalist investors can kind of count on to see appreciation in their wealth when they invest through Vox and we're investing in royalties. So do you think you're getting more non-traditional mining investors in Vox because of that? Or who is choosing to, to jump in on that? You know, to date, we've had a lot of success with the institutions, the who's who of, of precious metal investors. That's terrific. And we're really excited that these fantastic institutional investors understand the, the value that we're creating within Vox for our shareholders. That being said, we're starting to see the generalist audience really start to look at mining again, given just the inflationary pressure, the potential for an infrastructure bill to be passed. 
I think generalist investors are starting to warm up again to the commodity sector. And yeah, we're starting to see that effect within Box. It's early days though. And, uh, and, and we're obviously working on, on getting the word out. I think there's a rotation now that's going to happen back into commodities away from some of these other sectors broadly that's going to benefit the sector and, and hopefully Vox as well. And how do you guys talk about the industry to these investors? Other than, of course, you know, investing in, in a royalty company is different than investing in a mining company, right? So all the positives that you, that you laid out. But we talk a lot about how on Prospector and on the rocks that we have to communicate about mining. It is challenging. It is a high risk industry, but we make it so much harder by <laughs> that smelter return, right? I mean, all these all these terms that, that people do have to become educated to really understand. But at Vox, do you guys have an approach for how you communicate about what you're investing in that's that's helping you in that regard? Because getting institutions into the industry is great for everybody, regardless of whether it's royalties or directly. So you guys are clearly talking about it in the right way. Yeah, I, I think royalty companies can almost operate a little bit as a, as a beachhead for generalist investors to start getting more exposure within the industry. I mean, we've found that some of our generalist investors that have invested in Vox look at the underlying projects that we have exposure to and end up asking us questions about those projects. And in a lot of cases have become investors in those mining operations as well, because they look and say, well, if Vox is willing to take a royalty over that project, then it's probably a pretty good project or there's something going on that I should know about. And so I think royalty companies are a great first step for a generalist investor that's starting to really learn what they want to invest in and what the risks are investing in the mining space. So I I, I do think that royalty companies can help in that process, starting to generate that generalist investor, which, and and by the way, the generalist investor audience is magnitudes greater than call it the mining specialist audience. I mean, it's not even, it's, it's so much more significant. It's, it's really hard to quantify. So the more that we can reach out to the generalist audience and make the mining sector broadly a much more investable space, I think that's better for everybody in the industry. Yeah, I totally agree. And we're going to need a lot more capital to come into the mining industry to build all the mines that the world's going to need for this low carbon future that everybody is increasingly on board with, right? I I mean, that's something that you need general investors to come in to build all these copper and cobalt and lithium mines. Well, I I agree with you, Emily. I think the podcast and one of the things that, that you're out there doing for the industry that's huge is we absolutely have to find a way to build a more quality reputation of the industry for the broader capital markets. There is trillions of dollars that needs to shift from hydrocarbons and those industries into the metals. And right now, there's not enough investors that are, are truly willing to back the space for, uh, for a variety of reasons. And so the more that there's education around what the mining industry actually does maybe I would say shining light on some of the myths to the industry that you talked about previously on the podcast. Mining has to has to really, I think, work on presenting itself as an investable industry to the generalist investors that are out there around the world. Well, and you brought up myths. What are some of the myths about royalty companies that you'd like to debunk? Because I know I've heard a few. Or, or sometimes royalty get royalty and streaming companies get a bad rap for different things. So what do you want to blow open on that side? Some mining companies, frankly, don't like that royalties exist. And you'll see them be kind of very aggressive in terms of not wanting that exposure. The reality is, I think royalties are a key part of the ecosystem in the mining industry. It really allows and rewards the prospectors and the geologists, you know, the grassroots exploration that feeds the industry for generations to happen. And it rewards that. And so, for example, we've bought royalties from prospectors may, on many occasions and different, different entities that went out and did the hard work discovering these deposits for the mintiers and the majors to eventually bring into production. Well, that deposit was discovered because there was an economic reward to that individual or to that group to go prospect and put all that hard work. And as you know, Emily, as a geologist and having seen a bunch of projects, it's no easy feat to find an economically viable deposit. And so royalties really reward that ecosystem and create more more supply of great projects. And so 
there, there is some, I think from an operator perspective, royalties can be looked at as well. It's overall a, a negative industry. I think it's really a positive industry in terms of really rewarding and incentivizing the future growth and exploration in the industry. And that's what we're seeing. There's a lot of project generators out there that are going and doing the hard work to find deposits and geological anomalies. Part of the big reward of that is retaining a royalty over the project so that if they're, when the project does develop, they're exposed to some of that upside. And so that would be one myth. I'm, just, I'm struggling to think of other myths specific to the royalty industry. I think for streaming companies, there is a lot of times a bad rap in that they're financing a mining company and they're limiting some of the upside to that mining company, and especially in the equity markets. You know, I think that's a myth, to be honest. It, that's not part of our business model. But what I would tell you is typically streaming entities are offering a much lower cost of capital than what these mining companies can find elsewhere. And so at the end of the day, it usually is a cost of capital equation. And if streams happen to be the lowest cost of capital, then mining companies, I think, should be rewarded for financing the growth of their business the cheapest way possible. So that would probably be another myth. I think you could you could probably dispel by facts pretty easily, but, but that certainly exists in the industry. Yeah, because I think First off, people tend to lump the two together. And as you've, you know, really well articulated, they are very different and and are needed for different reasons. And I think uh, I love your explanation of how royalties incentivize prospecting and project generation. I had never really thought of that. But that's absolutely spot on. I mean, I know a lot of geologists that busted their butt and and these royalties really do keep them out in the field way into their career because they want to find another project and you know i think that's really accurate and i think with streaming companies the the myth that i've heard or the bad rap is that they're essentially like the loan sharks of the mining industry right <laughs> like they'll give you really expensive money up front and then you're paying it off for a long time when in fact like you said you know it's pretty easy for a company to determine the cost of that capital and a lot of times streaming companies will come in and help help you get through that last little phase of development where maybe other options don't make sense so it's a really needed source of money for the industry as well and i i do agree i think it's you know it's just kind of the tribal nature for lack of a better word of of our industry that 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 kind of has that perception. Yeah, I mean I think any time that there's a a new source of financing capacity that's added to the industry like streams, it it should really be celebrated versus looked so negatively upon because at the end of the day, you've seen very significant major mining companies take on streams. Again, not part of Box's business model, but what you can appreciate is that those opportunities, those financing structures have offered the lowest cost of capital to some of these projects and allow them to progress in maybe a situation where they otherwise wouldn't have been able to. And so I think that should be celebrated, not really disparaged for what it's actually the value that it's actually creating for that mining company and hopefully the streaming partner as well. Have you had any ideas of other creative or new financing structures that you think the industry really needs? Maybe that that's present in other industries or verticals that we haven't adopted? Not really, to be honest. I mean, I think the mining industry right now, it's been around obviously longer than most industries. <laughs> I, th- I think it does, uh, it does certainly have a number of different structures available to it across the capital structure from senior debt to equity and, and really everything in between. What I would say is a, is a little bit of a, a bend on that question is, you know, when you look at some of the reason why gold hasn't responded as much as if you go back 20 years ago, if you would have talked to someone that was kind of a gold economist, really was sitting there forecasting what would happen in the precious metals price arena, for where we actually sit today, the amount of government spending that's taken place that's almost unfathomable, the potential for an infrastructure bill, the inflationary pressure that's developed, Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies have taken so much of that speculation that I think what the mining companies need to do at a very high level, the majors, is to really, and, and who truly, there's very few people I think on this planet that really truly understand the cryptocurrencies. What they know they don't understand is mining. What I think needs to happen is that there needs to be almost a uniform digital currency that's back, that's underpinned by gold. You believe in the gold standard? Here is a digital currency that somehow brings that to the, to the table for investors to invest in, in the world of crypto. And then is out there as a consumer 
purchasing precious metals. And then that demand will then create the price that people expect gold should have, but it doesn't have it. So why doesn't it have the price that people would have expected? I think it's because speculation has gone to other forms of protection against the devaluation of fiat currency. Unfortunately, the majors are mostly focused on on mining and not so much on the technology and the, the digital world, where I think that's where they need to go. Because until that happens, how do you compete? The, the market for cryptocurrency has gone absolutely bananas. And yet gold price has been relatively subdued comparatively. That makes me probably not a huge gold bug at the moment, but there's a, a, a there, it is a very, very good component to anybody's portfolio, which is why we're in the business. But um, until that happens, really the mining sector is playing catch up. And somehow, some way, if that can, that can transpire, I think it, it's you know, very, very beneficial to the industry and everybody that's invested in it. I think that is such a cool idea, but it brings to mind like my comeback when people talk about like, oh, I don't want to put money into mining. I want to put it into crypto. I'm like, gold is the original token, right? <laughs> Like you can use it anywhere. Uh, like, so why would you put it into Bitcoin and not into gold? But yeah, what if you combine the two together and had a crypto backed by gold? Because I don't, I'll be frank, like listeners know, like crypto in general makes my, you know, it just drives me nuts because it's not a val. to me, it's not a value based investment, but yeah, maybe there's a way to combine the two. Well, and it's interesting. I think Elon Musk came out and said, well, actually, cryptocurrency isn't great for the environment, given all the electric, all the power usage you need. For what exactly? <laughs> you know, for what is it? At the end of the day, what is it that's consuming all this global power that is straining grids? It's certainly not friendly to the environment on, on that type of scale. And so I have not bought cryptocurrencies, probably should have bought cryptocurrencies, but I don't understand them. But what I would understand is a token that's fundamentally underpinned by a gold standard and how much gold is being produced and how much gold exists. And then that encouraging, you know, at the end of the day, purchases of gold. And so, yeah, I, I hope that someone in the industry that's far more capable than I, in terms of uh, spearheading that initiative, takes it and runs with it because I think there's a huge opportunity. And I think that's the missing piece or missing component to the mining industry and specifically precious metals really generating the, the price that everyone probably would have expected that they would have had. All right. So for anyone listening, if they if they use that idea, they've got to give you a royalty for it. Right? <laughs> I'll take it. I will take it. <laughs> they don't need a royalty crypto structure. But no, I think that's it, what you're talking about, though, really gets to something I'm passionate about, which is innovation in the industry isn't just like a new cool geophysical sensor. We do really cool stuff technically in mining, and there's a lot of smart people figuring out how to new, do new stuff. But our business model, in my opinion, does have to have some disruption come in, some innovation, because frankly, our, our values as an industry aren't really reflected in the way that we finance projects. A big thing that I always look at is diversity, for example, right? And I think a big reason why the industry has such a hard time becoming more diverse at the board and the management level is because when mining companies are raising money, they raise it based off of experience of the management team, right? I mean, that's like the number one thing you hear people reference. I've got so-and-so on my board. He's built six gold mines before. He's been in the industry for 35 years, right? And if that's the metric that investors use, it really doesn't create an opportunity for younger or, you know, people from outside the industry or people who haven't had that opportunity to kind of come up in the same way, or frankly, like to bring in people from outside the mining industry who maybe have cool ideas that would really help the industry grow and adapt. So that's where I, I'm always interested to hear thoughts on folks on the on the finance side, because I think it's such a we have been doing it really for the same way for so long, whereas other industries come up with new business models, new financing structures all the time. One of the problems that I think everyone in the industry has to work to solve is there are certainly some commodities that have negative ESG connotations and, right. and, and sometimes for truth and for reality. But a lot of times, you know, mining companies are getting a bad rap and are looked at as kind of an ESG liability when they're actually going to support 
what the global movement wants in terms of electrification versus hydrocarbons. And the mining industry has to kind of do a much better job in terms of articulating its value to the world in an ESG favorable light, which is, look, you don't want carbon in the atmosphere, then you need to come to us. You know, we, we are prepared to do it in such a way that, that really, you know, is, is environmentally friendly and is, is not, uh, you know, is not something you have to worry about or be concerned with in terms of its overall environmental impact. It's a net positive. And until that net positive by mining companies and just, you know, one mining company can't do it, two mining companies can't do it. It almost has to be everybody in the industry bringing it to light of, look, there's this underlying hypocrisy of you want electrification, you want clean energy, you don't want hydrocarbons. And again, that's societies to decide. But if that's what you want, then you need to be working with us, the mining companies, to uh, to bring that to market. Because I don't think anybody wants to be paying $250,000 for an electric vehicle, which is what's <laughs> going to happen right. if more mines aren't brought online. And I think at the end of the day, if that conversation can get elegantly presented to the generalist investor and then filter down into you know just your everyday person that isn't necessarily an investor, but just how they think about mining companies, we need that to change. Yeah. And I think it goes back to last week, I taped an episode with my friend B at Newmont. She has diversity and inclusion for Newmont. You know, she was pointing out that you never see the mining industry in a positive way in movies and TV. Like, never. never. <laughs> like, I want to talk never. to the CEO of Disney and Netflix and like, why don't we have, you know, why is it always the archaeologists that are the, you know, the spies that are going out around the world doing cool stuff because they're archaeologists, like finding treasure? Why isn't it a geologist, right? Why are all the sci-fi movies negative about going after asteroids or going into <laughs> these crazy places and kicking the indigenous people out? Why don't we have stuff set in like ghost mines, right? Really cool technology around and big trucks that little kids love, right? And I think it's such a, I can't figure out why that is. Like why we as an industry, we contribute so much. We contribute jobs, we technology, the the metals and minerals themselves. And yet for some reason, you know, we're just not out there talking to people. I think it goes back to say like the anacondas and this, the disasters. Disasters are always going to be, environmental disasters are always going to be more, talked about more kind of forefront. And I, I think if you went back and mining has been around so long and this, this really focus on the environment and protecting the environment, I, I think is not necessarily relatively new, but at least at a mainstream level has probably been something that's really kind of taken hold over the last call it 50 years. Mining companies over the last 50 years have really cleaned up their act by and large. And especially over the last 20 years, it needs to be kind of mining 2.0 or mining 3.0 comes out to the market and says, look, this is what we're about. You don't have to worry that we're going to leave the land worse than we found it. That's not yeah. going to happen. And scientifically back that up and work on a little bit of a you know propaganda around that because in people's minds, you're right, Hollywood is not ever mining in a favorable light. And because if you look back over history, there were so many environmental disasters you see tailings and you see different issues where water's been kind of poisoned for generations. Yes, that happens. But mining now, I mean, the amount of permitting that needs to happen and the focus on water quality is has gone up so significantly that, you know, most cases, the land is not going to be worse off than it was before mining started. And that's what I think mining companies have to get mainstream. That understanding that, look, it is not as toxic as you think it is. And in fact, we're doing all the things that we need to do to make sure that it isn't. When that happens, look, I think mining becomes a favored industry. And, and that for us to, to kind of reach the goals that we have for the industry, that has to happen at some point. But it, it takes the majors that have a lot more clout and wherewithal to look at ways to partner, maybe, maybe in ways that they haven't thought about before. And hopefully that happens. Yeah, I'm, we need a new reality TV division <laughs> for the mining industry because like you look at all, I just saw today, there's one uh, a TV show was pulled on Discovery called Jade Fever, where they, I guess, and I think it was British Columbia, you know, they had folks out doing artisanal jade mining legally, right? And the, the First Nation was like, you are not allowed to be here. And who told you this was okay to the, you know, the all the Alaska 
gold mine or mine, you know, gold. Well, you've got, yeah, you've got gold like, rush out there, alluvial mining, yeah. you know, kind of wrecking the waterbed. I mean, so it's like, just. This is what people, when I tell them I'm in the mining industry, they're like, oh, like that gold rush TV show. And I'm like, no, not like, like that. No, there's not much good about what's going on there. Yeah, they, they certainly don't see, I think, the bright side of the industry and really the reality of the industry these days. And so hopefully, hopefully that can change because that's, that's going to be better for everybody. I think is, you know, the, the global citizen is going to benefit from there being more supply of metals and, and frankly, you know, the precious metals then offering that safe haven, you know, kind of true counterbalance to, to fiat currency and that exposure in a way that you can understand that's not, you know, crypto because still, I don't know how many hours I'd have to spend to try to just barely understand what's going on in crypto. Well, and so on that, you know, talking about ESG issues, when does that come into play when Vox is making a royalty decision? Like, how does that work? Like, how do you enact ESG values as a as a royalty company? Yeah, you know, it's a really interesting question because as a royalty company, we're not the operator of a mining company or a, or a mining project. And so, what we're able to do for our investors is, is by and large, we're able to generate exposure in such a way over projects that that we choose that we think measure up from an ESG perspective. But the hard part for a royalty company is at the end of the day, you know, we're not the ultimate operators. We're not on the ground dealing with the, the practicalities and realities of running a mining operation. And so we have to, at a high level, understand what's going on. We Look, we've passed on deals because if you take Chile, for example, there's all kinds of consequences to trying to get a mine started where there's not enough water for both the mining operation and the agriculture operations and the communities. And so there's a lot of situations where you can certainly buy royalties where the, the underlying project and operator doesn't have the license to operate and doesn't have the relationships with the community that it needs. It might want that relationship, but it doesn't yet have it. And so we end up passing on quite a few opportunities where when you really get to understand what's going on the ground, it doesn't hit the ESG threshold that it needs to hit. And how do you guys determine what's going on on the ground? That's part of your due diligence process and the, the mining engineers and the experts that you, you all have on your team go and, and look at that in person? Yeah, a lot of our portfolio, we're the second largest holder of hard rock uh, mining royalties in all of Australia, second to Franklin, Nevada. You know, we have the benefit of being in Australia, having boots on the ground in Australia Three of our key business development executives are, are Aussie citizens as well. So we have a very good understanding of what's going on there. That's where most of our exposure lies. And so we're able to kind of understand the issues at, at a tangible boots on the ground level. In some instances, you know, we're very much forced to rely on public information and look for information uh, from a number of different sources to, to triangulate on an opinion and a viewpoint on both the, the qualities of the asset and certainly the ESG process around it. Okay, that's really cool. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's such a an interesting perspective because like you said, you don't have control necessarily and you're not, you know, you don't even necessarily have that incentive of I'll invest if, right? Like, I mean, it's a, it's a different kind of type of leverage that you have, but the leverage of that selection is, is really important. And I would imagine for a generalist investor, knowing that you get the exposure combined with the due diligence that you all do is another way to mitigate concern around ESG risk, right? As opposed to them having to, to do that due diligence themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I think that's one of the big benefits that we as a royalty company offer, offer to the investors. Mm -hmm. And so looking ahead at the rest of 2021, maybe 2022, you know, what are you excited about that Vox is doing or, or wants to be doing in the next few years? Yeah, the last few years have been really exciting for Vox. We've led the entire industry in growth over the last couple of years. We have just a tremendous amount. We did a lot of hard work, Emily, and something that I know you'll appreciate is our geologists and our mining engineers were very specific in the projects that we took royalties over and brought those into the portfolio. And what we're seeing is if you follow Vox, I mean, every couple of weeks we're coming out with just such quality fundamental growth over the, we have 50 royalties and streams over these assets by the operating partners. And with so much exposure in Australia, where gold in terms of Aussie dollars has been an all-time high now for approaching four years, these companies have been well-financed well incentivized to move their projects ahead on the development curve at a faster pace than expected. And so 
our organic portfolio, those 50 streams of royalties that our investors don't have to pay anything more for um, that were acquired at very good value are building just such a, a fantastic pace. And that's really creating a lot of value. The other thing that I'm excited about is we continue to find, and, and one of the things that you did with Prospector and your different ventures is you took really a, a technological driven kind of approach to the industry. And that's what we've done on the royalty side. We purchased a database of 7,000 proprietary royalties, and now it's approaching 8,000 around the world where we have a roadmap to interesting royalties that a lot of the industry doesn't have. And so that's allowing us to find these really interesting projects that we can get royalties over. I mean, we've found doctors in remote cities in, in West Africa that held royalties that no one knew about. We found royalties held by prospectors where we literally have someone you know, driving out to the bush in Australia to track them down and see if we can buy their royalty from them. We found royalties held by telecommunications business, hearing, hearing technology companies, automotive parts businesses. We found royalties where with groups and different individuals that you never would have expected that they owned a royalty. But that started really with finding a project that we liked, having some information about it that, that made us want to transact on the underlying royalty and the underlying project. And so we continue to do that for our shareholders. It's exciting to get the word out. I think we really present a unique opportunity for the generalist invest investor, especially to get the right kind of exposure to commodities. And that continues to build every day for our shareholders. I think that's so, so exciting because I, for me personally, I love to see when, you know, the value of the industry, right, actually like turning, you know, prospects into minds combines with technology, right? And anytime technology and innovation can contribute to positive projects moving forward is just so cool. And that's really the whole purpose of any kind of technology coming into an industry, right? I mean, so allowing you to find all those crazy royalties all over the world that also then allows generalist investors to get access to this exposure is a really cool innovation. So congrats for, for making that happen to you and the team. Yeah, thank you. It's exciting. I mean, we're we're really a, a bunch of mining geeks that uh, you know we like going on the treasure hunt and finding really interesting projects, and that's what it's all about. We have the expertise as someone like you can appreciate that's needed to really understand what we're looking for and what we're trying to acquire. And it's it's quite a rewarding job. It's fun to be able to be kind of in the position that we are generating that kind of value for investors. Yeah, it's a it's a really good time. I think to be a Vox shareholder, and I think overall to be in the industry. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on and talking about royalties with us. And I'll cheers my iced coffee to you across the screen. Likewise. Um, and look forward <laughs> to having you on again soon. Yeah, thanks, Emily. It's been a pleasure. Thank you to our guest and my colleague, Kyle Floyd, for joining us on this episode of On the Rocks. To learn more about Kyle and Vox Royalty, visit voxroyalty.com and check them out on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. For more about Prospector, go to prospectorportal.com or check us out on Instagram at Prospector AI and LinkedIn at Prospector Portal. Thanks for joining us on the rocks. Until next time, keep your glasses full and your ice cold.